Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Nelson Bernier, and I have the privilege of serving as the president of the UNC Health Foundation. And it's just a delight to welcome you this afternoon to our impact series on otolaryngology head and neck surgery. You're in for a real treat today with three outstanding panelists. And I'm gonna take a couple of seconds just to introduce them. But before I do that, I wanna remind you, as you saw in the slideshow, that you are able to ask questions during this session and we really do encourage you to do so. Just check anonymous when you go in to ask a question. You're also welcome to chat directly with the panelists. You're, you won't be able to chat with the participants back and forth, but please do feel free to go ahead and chat with our panelists. So our speakers today, I'd like to introduce them to you. Dr. Del Yarbrough is the Thomas J. Dark Distinguished Professor of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery. He also serves as our chair and I'm excited to share a little kind of tidbit about Dr. Yarbrough, and that is that he loves baking, baking all things, but most recently um, perfecting his biscuit recipe and also caramel cake, which just sounds wonderful. I wish we were all in person so that we could partake in his goodies, but hopefully next time. Dr. Brent Sr. is the Nathaniel and Sheila Harris Distinguished Professor. He holds a number of um, positions within our department. He's the vice chair of academics and outreach. He's the chief of the division of rhinology, allergy, and endoscopic skull based surgery. And he has been really busy with his first grandchild. He has a new granddaughter who's about 17 months old and her name is Matilda Rose and she's precious. I hope that when he shares his um, personal reflections, he may comment on Matilda. And then last, but certainly not least is Dr. Trevor Hackman. Dr. Hackman is the Vice Chair of Inpatient Operations and Quality for the Department of Otolaryngology, and he's also our Head and Neck Fellowship Director. A real passion and skill and gift for education, and I'm delighted that you'll be able to hear from him today too. So I'm gonna ask each of the speakers to start us off before they do their presentations with just a minute or so on personal reflection. And so I'll ask um, Dr. Yarbrough to start, then Dr. Senior, and Dr. Hackman will end up with you, and then you go ahead and take your presentation away from there. So Dr. Yarbrough, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, well, um, thanks, Leslie, and, and thanks for that warm uh, introduction. Um, I, I, I'll be happy when we can get together and, and have cake and biscuits and maybe other things too. But, um, you know, really what a challenging year um, we've had, but I've got to say, one of the things that makes me really happy is when I get to share some of our jams and jellies and biscuits, maybe one of these days, about what we do in otolaryngology um, with all of you. Um, let me just start by saying that last year with the COVID pandemic has really stressed us and our systems and our routines for providing care and for advancing our missions and education and research. Um, but it's just so great to work at a great institution and with our team of doctors and nurses and staff and researchers and teachers um, to continue to meet our missions during this time. We had to nimbly and quickly adapt um, our clinic. Um, we did all kinds of things where we changed patient flow. We created barriers to protect patients and staff. We had deep cleaning of rooms. On the educational side, we're all getting pretty good at Zoom. Uh, knock on wood, I hope nothing goes wrong today. But um, the, the residents went on furlough for a while. We didn't have the appropriate amount of PPE and everybody, even though there was a lot of fear, everybody stepped up because we had to continue to provide uh, care for our patients and meet our missions. On the research side, we altered our labs and trial enrollment and we engaged and um, contributed to new research on COVID with smell and, and, and taste loss. And while we've been challenged, I think we're coming out of this really stronger than we were before with a lot of new ideas, a lot of new processes. Um, I think some of our uh, you know, patients will benefit by uh, us being able to do some things through Zoom, particularly speech language pathology and maybe even some hearing now. Um, and personally, uh, as Leslie mentioned, I've gotten a little bit better at some of my baking. Uh, my wife calls it stress baking. So uh, we have all kinds of things around now. Um, and you're gonna meet a few of our, our, our outstanding faculty today. They're extremely experienced. Um, they're dedicated to advancing knowledge and care for diseases of the upper air digestive tract. And um, at otolaryngology, a, a lot of people don't understand the full, uh, um, the full aspects of what otolaryngology encompasses. Um, 
but it basically advances care and knowledge for a wide range of illnesses that impact our appearance, our communication, our ability to eat, drink, talk, and hear. And I think some rightly say that otolaryngology cares for what makes us human. Um, so today you're going to hear part of what we do, and I really look forward to it. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. Dr. Senior, I'll turn it over to you now. Thanks so much, Leslie, and, and um, thanks for all of our people that are watching us here today. This is just uh, great that people are taking time out of their schedules to spend a few minutes with us in otolaryngology. It's a real, a real honor that you're doing that. I, I gotta say, um, Leslie, I, I've just decided that I'm against COVID. I'm just totally against it. It has- uh, I love it, it has, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in case anyone else had any other thoughts, I'm just against it. I mean, you know, we live in a very divisive time right now. There's a lot of different opinions out there in the world. And, uh, but I think we can all unite against the COVID. And then and uh, and get behind that. But but you know, as as uh, uh, I'm sure many of you who are out there are, are recognizing that we make lemons out of lemonade out of lemons, right? You know, we've all been offered tons of tons of lemons uh, with this last year. I also have uh, uh, taken on some new habits, and I didn't know that Dr. Yarbrough was actually into baking. But I want you to be jealous of me, Wendell, <laughs> because this is my Christmas present that I got from my daughter because she <laughs> recognized my outstanding baking skills that have been flourishing during during the time of the uh, pandemic here. Sounds like a so, bake-off um, is coming, right? Definitely it sounds a like a uh, baking challenge. It, yeah. Uh, I'd like to see you stand up against my ginger snaps. I'll tell you that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I will say, though, um, it has been amazing to see how our department, how the folks in our department from our uh, schedulers through our, our support staff in the office to our, our um, nursing staff and, of course, all the docs, all the residents, how, how they've come together during this time has been unbelievable. So much selflessness, and it's been so encouraging. Uh, to me, uh, despite all of the, the hardships that we've all been dealing with. So anyway, so that's how that's how I'm doing. Thanks uh, again for uh, hearing me out here. Sure. Dr. Hackman. Wow, Bake Off. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> as you heard, I'm, I'm, I'm the only non-distinguished professor on this panelist, and I guess it's because I'm not baking to the degree that <laughs> these two are. <laughs> But this is this is this also shows when you leave surgeons idle, they must do something. When we don't have patients to take care of and the volumes go down, their hands have to do something. So that's that's amazing. Um, I would I would agree with what Dr. Yarbrough led off with, which is that I think what this year has taught taught us is that uh, life is really about connections and COVID and the inability to make connections in in person and having to learn how to make connections online. Uh, has really been, I think, a theme for, for me, for my family, and I think for everyone is, is the importance of connections and how vital it is to being human. And I think that uh, I would echo what Dr. Yarbrough said, which is that one of the things we feel like we impact for patients is the ability to make connections with smile, with speech, with uh, going out to dinner together, with being able to hear and talk to each other. And so our field is it's more than just taking out tubes and tonsils. It's, it's about the functional processes that, that Dr. Yarbrough mentioned of, of making us human and allowing us to have connections, allowing us to appreciate the smell of a meal, the texture of it, to be able to enjoy a laugh with a friend. And so we really pride ourselves in when we take care of patients, trying to do so with not only the goal of improving their disease, but also impacting positively on the quality of life uh, when we do that. On a personal note, the biggest stress I've had in COVID was when our new cat got outdoors a week ago. And uh, since the cat is more well liked than me and the family, and I was the one that left the door open, uh, I was thrilled that later that night, I was able to find it two doors down in a neighbor's bush. Because I think if I had not come back with a cat that night, that I would be sleeping outside in the garage. And so <laughs> knowing, knowing where you are and where your place is in this world is always a, is a good reminder. And that was my reminder for, for COVID. If I can handle that stress, I think anything else is easy. <laughs> wow, yes, that's a great story, yeah. Dr. Hackman. <laughs> we'll let you start with your presentation now. Sure, so 
I think Dr. Arbor's already kind of covered that we are, uh, otolaryngology is truly a, uh, a large field that allows for impacting a lot of different aspects of quality of life. I can only touch on so much in a brief 10 minute talk. Uh, and so I wanted to give some highlights about some of the new technologies that we use in otolaryngology and that I particularly use myself. Uh, although there's many more uh, aspects of otolaryngology that I won't even touch, such as sinus surgery and ear surgery and, and swallowing uh, and pediatrics. Um, but when you look at uh, our field, we really are rapidly changing and evolving. And we run the gamut of, of robotic surgeries and new, uh, new sleep surgery techniques and minimally invasive salivary surgery. Uh, the use of technology such as radiofrequency ablation to treat thyroid lesions and then reconstructive surgery. And in the brief time that I have to talk, uh, and I'm happy to field questions in the chat afterwards, I want to touch on sort of how these different aspects of new technology are allowing us to advance the care of patients. The first I'll, I'll start with is robotic surgery. And robotic surgery really is the idea of operating in tight spaces with instrumentation that allows us to use the dexterity of our hands when we can't get our hands inside of a closed space. And so the robotic system, which is, this is the new SP system, allows us to put instrumentation into a small space and articulate it. And we're sitting at a console, just like the gentleman below, and we are articulating these different tools and allowing us to perform the surgery the way that our hands would perform it if we had the space to use um, the tools. And so this really has advanced the ability for us to take care of certain cancers and diseases of the upper aerodigestive tract. Uh, you look through this viewfinder that gives you a three-dimensional view as a console surgeon. So you're looking through this eyepiece and you really get a 3D view of what's happening. And it allows you again to articulate the instrument like your wrist or your hand would articulate. And what this does is with this new SP system allows us to get deeper into the throat and operate on cancers, on disease entities deeper down in the throat that otherwise would require fairly destructive surgeries. And like we mentioned earlier, not only do I wanna treat somebody for the cancer and give them a survival from their cancer and a cure from their cancer, but I wanna do so, but also preserve the quality of their life afterwards. And part of that goes to making sure that I can preserve their speech, their swallowing. And a lot of that goes to how we operate. It, traditionally, 20, 30 years ago, we did a lot of open surgeries where we would split jaws apart and take tissue down to get back to the back of the throat to get access. And the challenge with that is when you start to disarticulate all of those structures, they all have complex functions and coordinations and, and you disrupt all of that. And I tell my patients, robotic surgery is sort of like remodeling the bathroom in your house. You would never take off the exterior walls to your house to redo the bathroom. You would have them come on the inside and gut everything because you don't want your house to fall down. And robotic surgery is sort of the same way. It's the idea of can we take the tumor out without making the house fall down so that the function can be better. So patients can be swallowing sooner, can be talking sooner. And this is an example of this small little tumor here on the left image, which is in the center. That little small tumor would normally require a fairly open approach, but with robotic instrumentation, I can create this surgical wound, take that tumor out, and that wound, while it looks large, is not much different than the wound that would be caused by having your tonsils out, which means that the patient has some soreness to the throat, some trouble swallowing, but they're probably back to functionally eating a normal diet within two to three weeks, whereas they may be gastroscopy tube dependent and tracheostomy tube dependent and having a very long recovery if we were to do an open surgery on them. Within the realm of sleep surgery, the biggest thing that you've probably all have heard about on the radio and on the TV is Inspire. We offer a full gamut of sleep surgery here at UNC and listed below are all the different things that we do. But the latest technology that's out there is this hypoglossal nerve stimulator. Now this nerve stimulator is designed to dynamically reposition the tongue when you're sleeping. And the reason I like this new therapy, and it's not for everyone, is that it truly does allow you to modulate the position of your tongue, which opens up your airway at night, as opposed to most of our other surgical techniques, which are permanent surgical alterations. And the idea that you can take something that is off during the day, and you'll see the gentleman in this bottom photo, and you put the remote on, there's a 30 minute delay, and then you're able to fall asleep. And then after 30 minutes of you being asleep, the device activates. 
you can see the size of the device comparatively to the size of a quarter. And that device is buried in deep to the, uh, the soft tissue in the chest, kind of like a defibrillator for a heart patient. And what that does is that allows the tongue to be moved out of the way at night when you're sleeping. And for some people, this may be how they sleep. This is the back of their throat. This is their tongue. And you can see their tongue is falling down in the back of their throat. And so when they're trying to sleep at night, they're breathing through a straw. And if you can't, if, if you can't breathe, you can't breathe through a straw, it just doesn't work. And so for patients who have moderate sleep apnea, who have this kind of tongue-based collapse, and who have tried their hardest to use CPAP therapy, Inspire becomes an option. And this is an example of that same patient. When we do the Inspire therapy for them, when they breathe in, the tongue moves forward. They breathe out. They breathe in, the tongue moves forward. And so the idea is that you're moving this tongue off the back wall of the throat using technology where there's a microphone implanted by the rib cage that senses your chest wall motion so that every breath you take in triggers the tongue to move forward. And this sort of new technology is something we've been offering here for a couple of years now, and honestly is a excellent therapy option for patients who can't tolerate CPAP, who have obstruction issues. I have patients who can fly now and travel because they have this as an option, as opposed to before when they'd be lugging around their CPAP machine and still not getting restful sleep. If we move out of the realm of sleep surgery, the other thing that we are very well known for at UNC is minimally invasive salivary surgery. Uh, I personally have been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, I will tell you that we are one of only two centers in the entire country that does this in the office, awake under local anesthesia. I have, this center here is the highest volume center for that in the country. Um, we have tons of experience and what we're able to do is endoscopically treat disorders such as stones. And yes, just like you can get kidney stones, you can get stones in your salivary system. And we have the ability to go in with telescopes and wire baskets and retrieve these stones in an office setting and remove them with minimal discomfort, all under local anesthesia and a much shorter day. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a while now. And what I can tell you is my patients prefer the in-office setting for the most part. It's less time, it's lower cost, my patients can give me biofeedback during the procedure. They can sit there and watch me do what I'm doing. They can understand what's happening. Uh, trying to give instructions to the patient postoperatively. If you've ever had surgery and you've had a surgeon come talk, the doctor told them and all they're thankful for is everything went well and they can't remember what you told them. And so the office setting allows us to really communicate with the patient who's fully awake and can process what's happening and, and give me biofeedback. This a few years ago and showed that we reduced time in the time of the procedure from over four hours down to 39 minutes, which talk about saving a patient's day, having a 39 minute procedure versus four hours is big for me, but it's also big for them. Um, looking at overall charges and costs, reducing the, the overall cost to, from the patient from $14,000 down to $700. So reducing the cost and the burden to the patient is the reason why I offer this as a therapy. And it's something we've been doing at a high volume here at UNC for quite some time. The last realm I'll talk about is reconstructive surgery. This is another pinnacle. And I have four very excellent partners who also do reconstructive surgery with me. Uh, to let you know what reconstructive surgery is, it is basically the idea of transplanting tissue from one part of the body to another part of the body. And for us, we do a lot of surgeries up in the head and neck area for cancer and for trauma, where we do have to, unfortunately, take away the scaffolding of their speech and swallowing. And we want to restore that with the most amount of function that the patient can have. We want them to be able to finish the procedure and go back to a quality of life that's worth living. These surgeries take eight to 12 hours, they're complex. We do about 180 to 200 cases of these per year. So we are a very skilled center at doing this, doing complex reconstructions. We are building a facial reanimation program uh, as well. And just to give you a sense of this, this is a brief video and I'll be done shortly that shows you I'm able to get online with a company prior to a large surgery. This is a patient who has a large cancer involving their tongue in front of their jaw. I'm going to need to physically remove the entirety of their front jaw. 
preoperative planning where we can on software virtually perform the surgery and say, this is the area of the jaw I'm going to remove and then model that, pretend that we're gonna cut it out and then say, okay, how are we gonna reconstruct this? Well, I'm gonna to have to transplant tissue from the shoulder blade, from the bone. And then we can use CT images that become three-dimensionally rendered, hold them in virtually. And then online virtually we can plan, all right, I'm gonna use the lower leg bone about right there. And I'm going to use that. And so they'll bring in the software, they'll bring the bone in and we can actually virtually perform the cuts and what's, what's amazing about this is that it allows us to get perfect puzzle fitting pieces for the patient so that they can get as true of a reconstruction of their jaws as they would have as far as the profile of their face. And then the company is able to design medical models and cutting guys that literally plug and play onto bones. And if I just follow the algorithm, I can actually create this defect and I then can create this reconstruction and they're able to not only do this, but then generate software plates off of this where they can actually go into a plating system, put little holes on and, and say to me, what do you think about this plate? How would this fit for your patients? Normally I'd have to go in the operating room and bend a plate with pliers to kind of fit the angle of the jaw. They can actually map this out and then use a 3D printer to print a 3D titanium plate that fits custom to this jaw profile. And the beautiful thing, thing about this is that that was the pre-op planning. This is the CT scan of this patient post-operatively after the surgery. And that, I can't get that bone to approximate better. But even better than the CT scan is that this is the patient three months after finishing radiation therapy. And I would challenge somebody to say that he looks like he had major head and neck surgery. And that's the goal for what we wanna do. We wanna treat our patients, we want to cure their cancers, but we want them to be out in society, functionally connecting with other individuals and feeling like they are still functional members of society so they can walk and be amongst their colleagues and their, their peers and not be labeled as an oncology patient. I'll end with that and then say that there's one more highlight that we're gonna be doing at UNC and that's gonna be radio frequency ablation of thyroid nodules. Thyroid nodules are ubiquitous. We see a ton of them. Many of them are benign. And many people are bothered by the fact that they're there and they're benign. And the surgery for removal, while routine is not completely without risk. And one of the things that we are pursuing in this next 12 months at UNC is a program where we use radio frequency ablation to shrink thyroid nodules and make them evaporate and avoid the need for surgery where you can have it actually melted away without the need to have uh, a surgery that has its own risks. With that, I will close up my talk and uh, I open up to any questions at the end of the chat. Thank you. Dr. Hagman, thank you. That was just a wonderful overview of some very, very fascinating therapies that we're offering. Thank you so much for that. And again, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A or in the chat. And we will um, turn it over now to Dr. Senior. Well, great. Thanks again uh, for this opportunity to spend a few minutes with you all uh, uh, talking about some of the things that we're doing in the Division of Rhinology. Um, I figured I'd, I'd talk a, a little bit about cystic fibrosis. It's a disease that, that uh, impacts so many, so many people uh, around the world. And uh, one that's really quite uh, important to us in, in rhinology and in um, ENT in general. Uh, CF, cystic fibrosis is, is a disease that's, that's caused by a mutation, a genetic mutation in a gene called the CFTR gene. And, and what this does is it causes the mucus in the body to become very, very thickened. And it's mucus everywhere in the body. So any, and your body produces mucus throughout the different organ systems. And, and everywhere that this mucus is produced, it's abnormally thickened. And, and what this results in, it, it, it would seem like it's a simple issue. You know, it's just thick mucus, just deal with it, right? But what happens is it causes problems with 
with mucus uh, uh, building up in the lungs, for example, which results in, in pneumonias uh, occurring and results in recurrent pneumonias, which results in damage to the lung tissue. It results in, in mucus building up in the, in the GI tract, which results in, in you being unable to absorb food and nutrition the way that you normally would. And, and, it, and it results in mucus building up in the, in the pancreas, resulting in, in problems with uh, diabetes, uh, for example. And while um, cystic fibrosis results in uh, mortality because of the chronic lung disease in mo most patients, it's really the nose and the, and the sinuses, amazingly, which are really profoundly affected and, and cause a huge impact on the quality of life for patients with CF. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how to manage the nose and the sinuses in our cystic fibrosis patients and, and how to improve their quality of life. CF is the most common uh, uh, limiting, it's inherited illness in, in Caucasian patients. It, there are about 800 to 1,000 cases per year in the United States, new cases per year. And there's about 31,000 patients in the U.S. that live with CS currently. And it was originally described, or really originally uh, uh, identified in the United States back in 1938. Uh, a woman named Dorothy Anderson was diagnosed with it. She's she's the index case for the entire entire uh, United States, um, and and she died literally months after she was she was identified as having this disease. And what I can tell you is that the the advances that have been occurring over these last many years has been incredible with this disease. And, and we see here uh, in this little graph how lifespans have been increasing year after year after year. And uh, including here in the last few years with the advent of lung transplantation, we're seeing just huge increases in life expectancy. So whereas in 1938, patients were passing away in just months with this disease, now here we are in 2021 and patients are living 40, 50, 60 years easily with this disease. And in fact, this used to be kind of a considered a disease of childhood. It was only uh, children who, who were uh, diagnosed and, and who lived with this disease. And because unfortunately they were dying so soon, uh, they never made it into adulthood. But now with all the improvements that we're seeing, more than 50% of patients with cystic fibrosis are actually adults. And in fact, it's upwards around 60% now of patients living in the United States with CF are adults. And, and while we saw some huge benefits uh, in treatment of the disease in terms of longevity, increasing life uh, lifespans uh, since the 1930s, most of these methods, most of these things that have been uh, developed are really trying to treat consequences of the disease. So for example, we, we have damage to the lungs, we have recurrent pneumonias resulting in damage to the lungs. So we transplant those lungs to, to make those lungs new. Um, and, and similarly, we treat uh, diabetes, we treat uh, uh, diseases of the GI or uh, disorders of the GI tract, things like that. Well, a really exciting thing happened though in 2012. In 2012, uh, we were able to utilize for the very first time um, a new drug that directly impacts the result of the genetic disorder that causes cystic fibrosis. And this was hugely, hugely important because now we're not just dealing with the consequences of this thick mucus, but we're actually able now to to make the thick mucus normal mucus now with this drug by addressing this genetic problem. And, and these drugs have been coming out regularly since 2012. And we now have the latest greatest treatments available, which are called triple CFTR modulators. That's the newest drug. And it is indeed the most effective drug treatment yet for cystic fibrosis. And I have to say, you know, cystic fibrosis research has been something that UNC has become kind of famous for. 
Um, we have uh, wonderful people in pulmonary who are involved in CF research, and we feel fortunate in otolaryngology to also be a part of this team researching specifically CF and its impact on the nose and sinuses. CF um, impacts the nose and sinuses basically in a vast percentage of the patients, probably about 70% of patients with CF have nose and sinus disease. And, and while it's not likely that, that patients with uh, CF nose and sinus disease are gonna die from their sinus disease, that's not what's gonna happen. It really does make them feel miserable. If you've ever had a sinus infection, you know how miserable it can be. And unfortunately, a lot of our patients with cystic fibrosis feel that way with a sinus infection all the time. They have inflammation, they have headaches, they have drainage, they lose their sense of smell. It can be really quite difficult. So we uh, were excited to be a part of a uh, study with the University of Pittsburgh to look at the impact of these new agents, these new triple CFTR modulator agents on sinus and nasal quality of life. So we know that patients are living longer with cystic fibrosis, but are they living better? And what we found is in fact, yes, they're living substantially better. And in fact, after about six months of treatment with these new drugs, we are actually seeing uh, quality of life scores with uh, 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 of their sinusitis, with their sinusitis that are equivalent to people without sinusitis we are getting close to essentially curing the sinus disease that they have. And that kind of made us think about uh, some of the specific symptoms of sinusitis that some of our patients have. And one of them is, is loss of sense of smell. And, and this is a quote here. I have no idea who Thalassa Crusoe is, but you know, Thalassa Crusoe really nailed it when he or she, I do not know, um, said that the sense of smell can be extraordinarily evocative, bringing back pictures as sharp as photographs of scenes that had left the conscious mind. We've all felt this, right? You've had these experiences with your sense of smell where, where you get into an environment and you have this recollection as when you're exposed to this uh, particular odor that brings you back to a time in the past. It's a real true phenomenon. And that's how powerful our sense of smell is. And in fact, the sense of smell receptors are actually the largest gene family in the entire human genome. That's how important evolutionary wise, important the uh, sense of smell is. And it's important for forming memories as, as I said above, but, but it's also important for detecting toxins, for just enjoying your sense of taste. Uh, sense of smell and sense of taste are intimately related and certainly for experiencing and enjoying life together. So it has a profound impact on quality of life. So we wanted to know if these new powerful drugs in cystic fibrosis that are causing our patients with cystic fibrosis to live longer, we know that their sinusitis is doing better, but we wondered if their sense of smell was gonna improve because that could be so disabling for so many people. Well. Unfortunately, it didn't. We see so much improvement, a lot of the other symptoms, but when we do our testing for patients with a uh, loss of sense of smell and CF, we saw almost no change. Now, the caveat here is that the patients that we were tested were all adult patients. So we think that there may be an opportunity to actually start using these drugs in younger patients. And in fact, the FDA has just approved these drugs to greater than age six, use in greater than age six. And we have hope that by applying these drugs to younger people, that we will reduce the likelihood of sense of smell loss and, and, and not have to worry about it, trying to bring it back in the future, but prevent it from occurring in the first place. So we're real excited about this possibility that these drugs may in fact preserve sense of smell. So we really are uh, in, a, in a period of time, strange as it sounds, if you're gonna have an inherited, potentially fatal disease, it weirdly is a great time to have this disease. There's just been revolutionary advances in treatment that have changed it 
from a disease where people died in infancy to one where many, many, many patients are living into adulthood. And more important, that we can improve not just longevity, but we can improve quality of life with all these new medications that we have. And certainly we're proud and we're have, very pleased in UNC Otolaryngology to be contributing to some of this research, looking at how these drugs can be used to improve quality of life and hopefully to preserve our sense of smell uh, uh, for these kids uh, going forward in the future. So thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. It's great. Thank you, Dr. Senior. It's always such a pleasure to hear about your work. And I know this is just one of the many, many areas in which you're passionate. And so again, please just ask questions in the chat or in your Q&A. We've got some questions at the end that you all have submitted previously. So um, we'll, we'll get to those as well, but close us out, Dr. Yarborough. Oh, well, um, thank you so much. Um, you know, it, I'm, I've got to say, it's great to hear Trevor and Brent talking about all the things we do. I learn something every time I, I you know, I, I hear these things and it's amazing. You know, we got offices, you know, within walking distance of each other and it's always great to hear the talks. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is switch gears a little bit and talk about um, the um, head neck cancer. A little bit of stuff we're doing in lab uh, on a totally unexpected part of head and neck cancer. When I started my career, head and neck cancer, um, um, which is, you know, cancers of the mouth and throat, we'll get into that a little bit, was totally caused by um, smoking and tobacco related um, disease. But now we've got this brand new cause that's come up in the last 20 years, and we're really doing a lot to uh, study that. And then I'll also talk a little bit, a touch on, on a few more things that all of our divisions in the department do. So just a little bit about me um, so that you'll... Um, let's see if I can advance this here. We go. Um, so you know a little bit about me. Um, I started at UNC um, where I did a, my undergrad, medical school, did a fellowship and was on faculty, went away to Vanderbilt for a little while um, and then to Yale um, and then made a full circle and came back to UNC. And this is my family on the right. That's my son who graduated from Davidson. Um, so we've got deep roots in North Carolina. And I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the head and neck cancer because it, a lot of people are not as aware of head and neck cancer as other cancers. It is pretty common. There's about 60,000 cases per year in the United States. Um, and it's the sixth most common cancer in the world. Um, but its name doesn't really tell you what it is. And it's classified by subsite. So when the numbers are presented, they're all divided up as to how many larynx cancers there were and how many oropharynx cancers there were and how many oral cavity cancers there were so that um, they're not added all together usually for the statistics. So it sort of downplays the health impact of head and neck cancer. Um, and we did a survey a few years back and we've done another one recently, but we asked just the population in a survey um, if they knew what head and neck cancer was. And it was amazing the lack of knowledge about head and neck cancer. And since then, we've been on a big campaign to try to uh, inform people about this important cancer. Um, you see the correct answers are in the dark green and the, the incorrect answers are in the light green. And the, the best answer was uh, head and neck cancer, throat cancer, which is correct. And it was about 22% of patients but the second answer was brain cancer, which isn't correct. It was almost as much. And you can see just the, the lower and lower numbers of correct answers um, with a few incorrect answers that were higher. So the population by and large really doesn't know a lot or the awareness of head neck cancer and where we would like for it to be. So I mentioned that um, when I started my training, really, there's one type of head and neck cancer, and that was the type caused by tobacco. But um, during, the, uh, during my career, a second cause came up, and that's the human papilloma virus. And that's what I want to talk about now. These are just statistics from 2012 um, from the CDC. 
that talks about all the cancers that are caused by human papillomavirus. Um, the, the most recognizable one is uterine cervical cancer. But in 2012, the number of oropharyngeal cancers, which is a head and neck cancer subsite, surpass the number of uterine cervical cancer. So if uterine cervical cancer is a health concern in the United States, then certainly oropharynx cancer is also a health concern. And both of these tumors are caused by the human papillomavirus. So I want to just talk a little bit about what we know about the human papillomavirus. And of course, this is a simplified uh, schema of how the human papillomavirus causes cancer. And of course, this was developed in uterine cervical cancer. And the reason it was developed in uterine cervical cancer is because we've known uterine cervical cancers caused by HPV for many, many years. And head neck cancer caused by, uterine, by human papillomavirus is a fairly new thing. So I just want to point, uh, it, I just want to point out one thing on this schema, and that's this, this top line, episomal viral DNA, so when the human papillomavirus infects a cell, it infects it, 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 it inserts its DNA into the cell, but the DNA exists as an episome. And what that means is a circle of DNA that's in the cytoplasm. And that's the normal thing for HPV. And then it makes more HPV and the cells slough off the top and all of those little episomes now get repackaged into new viruses. So that's what it's designed to do. But when things go awry, these episomes also start getting integrated into the DNA of the cell. So that means the circular DNA now go into your chromosomes and they insert there. And when that happens, things start going bad. And that's when cancers start developing. Well, this whole model was developed on uterine cervical cancer. And we thought, well, this is great, you know, we're gonna, we know how HPV causes cancer in the head and neck. But what we found, what, when we started studying it, what we found was that HPV is not integrated in at least 30% of head and neck cancers, and another 20 to 40% have both integrated and episomal forms um, in tumor cells. And this is not common in uterine cervical cancer. So, we thought, well, maybe there's something different going on in head and neck cancer. And we wanted to understand that. So we, we um, combined with a national effort called the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA, where we sequenced about 500 head and neck cancers. And what we found was that there's a couple of genes that are mutated in HPV positive cancers. That's this top group here, but not in HPV negative cancer. So you can see the numbers over here, about 14% have mutations in this TRAF3 gene and about 14% have mutations in the CYLD gene. But in HPV negative, only 2% have mutations at each or so in these two genes. So we thought something special is going on here. Um, and we, we wanted to explore what these genes did. And we found out that these genes actually um, affect things that have to do with the HPV, um, the human papillomavirus maintenance in cells. So these genes are important for getting rid of the virus. And these genes are important for causing a cell that's virally infected to kill itself. And if these genes are turned off, now the cell that's virally infected stays alive. And rather than the cell getting rid of the virus, the virus DNA can stay in the cell. So we looked at how much of, uh, how these tumors that have these mutations, whether or not they had this integrated form of the virus or whether or not they maintained a circular episome of the virus. And interestingly, tumors that had mutations in these genes had no integration or these that say integration actually had both episomal forms and integrated. So to us, what this is saying is that there might be a different way that HPV causes cancer. It doesn't have to integrate into the DNA. It can be maintained as an episome as long as tumors carry these mutations in these two genes. 
So we were very interested in that, but that would also imply that if, if a tumor can maintain this circular viral DNA, it may also be able to make virus. And the reason that's the case is because that circular DNA is what gets packaged into the viral particle and then goes off and infects other cells. So we took some tumors and we did some um, fractionation of the tumors to basically, and that's what we have here, these fractions across the top. And basically what we did was determine if there were fractions that had these circular DNAs in them, and that's these bands here that are lighting up, you can see. So several of these fractions have the circular DNA. And this is just two ways to look for this circular DNA by PCR. And we also asked, did they have the viral capsid? In other words, the thing that surrounds the circular DNA if it's gonna make a virus. And that's this L1 protein. And you can see several of these fractions have not only the circular DNA, but they also have the capsid. So if you have the capsid and you have the circular DNA, we think we may be able to make virus. So what we did was we took these fractions and we put them on cells that do not have HPV. And then we looked to see if those cells would express HPV genes. And these are all the HPV genes. They're named funny things, E1, E2, E4, and L1 and L2. These lines are how much of these genes are being expressed in, in this cell. This cell is not an HPV expressing cell, but we put these fractions that we got from a head and neck cancer onto these cells, and all of a sudden they start expressing all the HPV genes. And when we look by electron microscopy, we see these things that look like viruses. So we think that these tumors are making virus and infecting cells in the, in the tumor. So we sort of came up with a model, and this is what we're studying. We're really interested in it because we think it can make a difference for our patients. So here's the model we talked about where the virus infects the cells here, and normally more virus is made and the cells slough off the top. But on occasion, these viruses can integrate into the chromosomes, and now all of a sudden these cells can become tumorigenic or become cancer cells. That's the, that's the classic model developed in uterine cervical cancer. Well, in head and neck cancer, we think there's a different model. We think these tumors can get infected by HPV. Inside the cell, the, the um, HPV DNA can be maintained as an epizole, and then it can get packaged, come out of the cell, and infect other surrounding cells and never integrate into the DNA. Um, so this has a couple of implications for us, you know. One is we think these head and neck cancers um, can produce particles containing HPV genes or basically produce virus. We think these viruses can be isolated from head and neck cancer because we've done it, and they can transfer HPV genes to other cells. And this transfer of HPV genes likely plays a role in head and neck cancer and carcinogenesis. And if we can find a way to attack that, it may be a new treatment for these cells. And we just, our, our total goal is to understand new mechanisms of how HPV causes cancer. We think we can impact not only head and neck cancer patients, but also other patients with HPV-driven cancers. So that's really what I wanted to tell you today about the HPV story. Um, here's the people that do the work, and I always like to point out, Natalia um, leads our HPV research effort. Travis Schrunk, so a head and neck surgeon, just got a K grant, which is a training grant to study some of this stuff. We have some residents that are in the lab as well, and, and, and um, Gary's our lab manager, Ina and Demir are um, postdocs that do this work. We have a big team at UNC um, with this vaccine immunology therapy group, the head and neck surgery group, and we still interact with the Yale head and neck um, group to do some work there. So I'm happy to share that with you. Now I just want to tell you one or two things about the department if we have time, Leslie. Okay, we I think so ahead. now we do. Yes. <laughs> okay, so, um, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, later on. Uh, so um, we have seven divisions in the department. It, it, it's, a, it's a fairly diverse department and you heard expertise from um, Dr. Hackman and Dr. Senior that, you know, th these people are, are leaders in the nation and, um, and international leaders. 
So you, you want expertise in head and neck, um, in um, otolaryngology, UNC is the place to come. So we, we're, uh, I think it, as Dr. Heitman mentioned, we have a facial paralysis center that we're really ramping up. We've got a new faculty member coming who just completed his, is completing his fellowship, Matthew Miller. Um, the leader of our division, um, Madison Clark, published a, a, one of the top three most read articles in Laryngoscope, which is a journal that we all read in otolaryngology, but basically on how to help people breathe better by doing this butterfly graph. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit about head and neck cancer. Now, Trevor talked about that, so I'm not going to harp on it too much. Um, but um, basically, I told you Travis got a, a K award. We have a U grant to study um, some prognostic biomarkers so that we can identify patients with good prognosis versus bad prognosis um, so that we can individualize and personalize therapy. Uh, we, we interact with the Yale spore and head and neck cancer, so we have a lot of, of cutting edge and innovative research that we are actually carrying into clinical trials for new treatments as well. I didn't talk about that today. Um, and our volumes are just increasing at an astronomical rate uh, because more and more people are recognizing the expertise that can be provided at UNC for these uh, tumors. Talk a little bit about neurotology. We haven't touched on that very much at all today, but this was our 1,000th cochlear implant for children. Um, at UNC, this is a life-changing thing. Children who are born deaf are now getting implanted before they're one year old, and basically they're living normal lives, being mainstreamed into normal schools, um, as opposed to going for, to schools for the deaf. Uh, one of the most um, life-changing things that I've certainly seen in my career, just amazing that we can be involved in this. We have such a great team. We're the, the busiest cochlear implant program in the nation. Um, we're hosting a lot of big conferences, of course, and we have research going on in that field as well. Um, pediatric, uh, what outstanding group of people. Uh, Dr. Drake um, is our, uh, was our first pediatric otolaryngologist and her father founded the um, uh, division of otolaryngology at UNC, uh, Dr. Fisher. Um, we have a new clinic, we're expanding where we are these people lead our multi-specialty care for, for pediatrics at UNC in so many areas, airway, dysphagia, craniofacial, um, and then also a lot of uh, cutting edge research in this group as well. Rhinology, Brent basically talked about cystic fibrosis. What a great uh, group and interaction we have with, um, with, with um, at UNC for cystic fibrosis research. Um, but that's not all this group does. I mean, these people are world renowned, do um, a, a tremendous amount of advanced care for, for people with um, complex sinus disease um, and also tumors um, in that area. Um, a lot of mentoring in this group and also some cutting edge research in this group. General highlights. Um, um, Trevor told you about the sleep work he's doing. He's doing a lot of this with our general otolaryngology colleagues. Um, we are also expanding um, general otolaryngology into Chatham um, County. Um, sleep medicine is a big thing. Uh, you know how many people have sleep apnea in the United States? There's a new procedure for hyoid suspension in, in addition to the hypoglossal nerve stimulator that Dr. Hackman talked about. Voice and swallowing is another one of our divisions. We have some outstanding research going on there. You see the grants that uh, Dr. Shah has recently gotten, um, as well as some clinical trials that have been open um, for treatment of RRP, which is resp uh, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, also an HPV-driven disease. So a lot of um, innovation in that area too. So that's what I have to tell you about the department, it's, it's so diverse, it's hard to squeeze it all into a short time, but I really uh, appreciate everyone's uh, um, interest in otolaryngology. Thank you, Dr. Yarborough. Yes, you're right. That's, it's a wonderful department and hard to go through absolutely everything <laughs> in a short time, but you did a really nice job. So in the closing minutes that we have together, I'm going to try to get to some of the questions that have been asked of you all. And if I may, I'd like to start with Dr. Hackman and ask, 
When a nerve that controls the movement of your tongue is removed from your neck, is there a possibility that that nerve will grow back? So any nerve removed from any part of the body, once it's removed, it cannot grow back. Um, if a nerve is traumatized, if it is um, separated and then, and then repaired, it can rejuvenate, but it, it, will rarely it will rarely rejuvenate in the same way it was built before. Okay, thanks. Dr. Senior, here's one about sinusitis. Um, how effective are air purifiers in helping with sinusitis? And if you have a favorite one that you would recommend, that would be great. So there isn't a lot of data on whether air purifiers can actually reduce the amount of sinus uh, uh, infection and sinus inflammation. But what it probably does do is it helps to reduce the sensitivity that people experience. So in other words, a lot of people can be sensitive to things in the air. It can cause sneezing, it can cause congestion, it can cause runny nose. It's not strictly speaking sinusitis, but it is still similar type symptoms. And that's where an air purifier can in fact be helpful. I wouldn't recommend a specific brand, but what I would recommend is if you're looking at them, look for one that is the high efficiency particulate type. That's the HEPA filter type. Those are by far the best. Those really do work. I'm not as excited about the ionizing one, things like that, but the HEPA ones actually are quite effective. Thank you. And Dr. Yarbrough, I'm gonna close with you and a question for, for you. Um, do you think there is any value in vaccinating against HPV with patients uh, with HPV induced tumor after they've been treated? Um, that's a great question. Um, and we, um, we thought the same thing. Uh, and we actually have proposed some studies to look at that. There is no data right now to suggest that. But um, we do think that um, if viruses being made, like our research suggests, and if surrounding cells are being reinfected, then the potential to decrease that, which is what the vaccine does, is it basically blocks infection, then there might be some value in that. Um, like I said, there's, there's no research on it. And I think, you know, one of the things that has, has hampered that research is that not a lot of people yet are, um, you know, um, convinced that this new mechanism of carcinogenesis um, for HPV is, is a real thing. Um, but I do think it's worth, it's worth studying. Um, whether or not it'll be effective um, remains to be seen. Thank you, Dr. Yarbrough. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions today. This is definitely a good place to stop and we can continue the conversation, but I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Erin Kenny, to close us out for this afternoon. Erin? Yeah, great. Thank you so much, everyone. This has been so wonderful. I am, um, as I said, Erin Kinney. I'm the development director for the department, and um, it's been nothing but a joy to work with all these wonderful people here. Um, as you know, you've heard a lot today, and there's so much more that goes on in the department. We do have some specific resources about all of this research that we've done, um, and we encourage you to take a look and share that with who you feel would benefit from some of this information. We will be also sending this as a follow-up in the email that you'll receive. Um, again, there's so much more to learn here. I look forward to working with all of you and talking about how we can involve you and your impact in the future. If you would like to support something like this and the research that we're doing, there also is a fund here that allows you to do that and you can learn more through that. Again, it will be followed up in the email you'll receive after this event. Um, in closing, you will be directed to a survey um, that will ask you a few questions about today. And I really do look forward to following up with everyone here on this call, talking to you about your interest, hearing more about your stories and how we can work together moving forward. And um, really that's about all I had. And um, I hope you all have a wonderful day today and enjoyed all this great information. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks so much, Dr. Senior, Dr. Yarbrough, and Dr. Hackman. Thank you, Aaron, for your closing remarks and be well. We'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone. Bye.